Welcome to Watch and Learn. Today we're going to start Christina's journey to finishing the Alaska quilt. I'm Kim Sandberg and Christina Whitney. And boy, Christina, I am so excited to get this journey started. So the Alaska quilt, the infamous Alaska quilt. Why don't you yes. get us rolling? Okay, well, let's just talk for a second about the process that we're gonna be using for this series. Yes. So we're gonna do things a little different. We're mm -hmm. gonna kind of mix it up. Rather than having it all here in the studio, mm -hmm. I'm going through this journey at home. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to be the one filming everything. <laughs> so please be nice. <laughs> I'm doing my best. But filming and then talking through my thought process. Mm -hmm. The why did I decide to do this? Um, what should I do here? So getting a little bit more into my head. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, it's a scary place, but it's a creative place. <laughs> Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. But it's, it's gonna be a little bit more real life quilting. Mm -hmm. From the very beginning where I've loaded the quilt, picking out threads and stuff, to eventually getting it all the way done and making it all the way up to Alaska. So yeah, it's, it's gonna be fun. I've got my bags packed and I'm ready to quilt. All right, well, let's, uh, let's dive into Christina's world of quilting. I am here in my home studio, so welcome. Glad you could join me. I will be working on my Alaska quilt, and this has been a quilt that I've been working on for a while, so a little bit of background. I saw a picture of this quilt on Instagram and absolutely fell in love with it, and so I did a little research, found out what it was called, and it's called the Alaska quilt, and it's a pattern from Laundry Basket Quilts, and I kind of have a weakness for blue quilts, so of course I was drawn to it, but I loved the overall look of it. So when I found out it was called the Alaska Quilt, I knew I had to buy it because I am actually from Alaska. So born and raised, love it up there. I still have family up there. And um, so anyway, so I made this quilt. I bought the pattern probably the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, and started piecing it. And then I found out that my parents were going to sell their place up in Alaska and move out of Alaska. So I thought, okay, I've got to finish this quilt so that I can take it up with me for my last trip up to Alaska and to their cabin and see them. So I worked really hard and finished the quilt top, did not get it quilted. But this quilt went with me to Alaska and I did kind of a version of Flat Stanley, but quilt edition. And it went all over the place. I got tons and tons of pictures with it in just random places. If you want to see some of those pictures, you can look at my Instagram account. It's Christina's underscore quilting. And you can see all the, the fun adventures that that quilt went on. So we're going to fast forward a little bit. So I finished that quilt back in 2021. It is now 2023. Um, at the beginning of this year, I made a goal and it was actually recorded. So I have to kind of try to live up to it. But I had a goal to have it quilted by the end of 2023. So I've been procrastinating it because I don't know what I want to do. This has been a really hard quilt for me. So if you look at the picture, I've uploaded it to a, an app called You Doodle. And for the last two years, I've been looking at this picture and trying to doodle ideas of what I want to do with this. Um, I decided that I did want to do custom. And I want it to be not super, super heavy duty quilting, like micro quilting all over the place because it is a king size quilt. It is giant. Um, I added an extra border onto this one that wasn't in the original pattern. But um, I want it to be able to be displayed as well as used on a, a bed. I just keep looking at this picture and thinking, what am I going to do? There's just so many secondary designs, so many circles overlapping that it became very overwhelming to me. And I still have no idea what I'm gonna do, but I did come up with kind of the concept of the bones that I'm wanting. So I am going to get it loaded. Well, you can see behind me, it is already loaded and I've already started it, but I'm gonna walk you through some of the processes that I've gone through. So. Um, we're gonna make it work. First thing, I had to do my backing. 
So my backing is a bunch of my Alaska fabrics that I've collected over the years, and I just piece them all together. Of course, most of them are some shade of blue, um, but those are all pieced together. It wasn't quite wide enough that I would have room to clamp onto my backing fabric and still be able to do ruler work without bumping into those clamps. So I added a couple strips on either side to make it just a little bit wider so that I wouldn't have to deal with that as I'm doing ruler work on this quilt. Okay, so that's the backing. Next thing that I did was I chose my batting. So here's what I did, two layers of batting. I've got my 80-20 cotton, and this is um, a cotton, or 80-20 from uh, Quilter's Dream. And then this is a layer of wool batting, again, from Quilter's Dream. So I put my 80-20 down first, then the wool on top, and that's gonna help me get a little bit more definition as I do some of this custom quilting. After that, I chose my threads. This was a fun one. When I was teaching at a show, I received this kit from Wonderfill, and look at those colors. Absolutely amazing. So I thought, oh, that'll be perfect for this quilt. So that was option number one. Option number two was some different threads from Superior Threads, and I just went through my stash, and I picked out ones that had colors that I liked that went with it. So I've got, this one's an Omni. It's a 40 weight. Let me make sure I'm not giving you the wrong information. 40 weight. And then I've got this one that's a micro quilter that's a hundred weight. A couple more micro quilters. And so I was kind of going back and forth between different weights. Um, for something like this with a lot of stitch in the ditch, I generally try to use a finer thread so that it sinks in. I'm also looking at this quilt and trying to decide what's going to be the star of the quilt. Do I want my quilting to show or do I want the piecing to be the star? Now for this particular quilt, I definitely want the piecing to be the star. The quilting is just going to be extra texture to add to it. So with that being said, I went with option number three, which is a mono poly thread from Superior Threads. So this is a clear thread. So as I'm going over between like say the, the light colors and the dark colors, I can use that same thread and not have to change the thread and it doesn't show up. So that's what I chose for this quilt. And the rest of the, or the rest of the threads get to go back on my shelf for me to look at and enjoy. Prepping the quilt, getting it loaded. I've got my machine set up so that the frame is in standard view, meaning I have got my backing was loaded on here, my top was loaded on here, and then the back was loaded to the take-up pole. Now you'll notice that I have already gone through and did some of the stabilizing on this, so I no longer have it on this top pole. So just use your imagination. And if you have questions on how to do this loading process, there's a video that I did with my Blues Quilt series, and it is from January 17th, 2023, and it's actually called um, Basting and Loading. So I basted my quilt onto my leaders. So if you look closely up here, I'll see if I can get a, a good shot in a minute, but it, there's no pins. I've actually sewn that to the leader just with a basting stitch because this quilt's gonna be taken on and off quite a bit between having to do other customer quilts, um, taking it into the filming studio work and having some filming done there. I didn't wanna have to deal with pins. Okay, I've already stitched my plumb line through the batting and backing, moved my quilt top over that to make sure it's nice and straight, did this basting stitch along the top. I then did my basting down both of the sides. So every throat space, I'm gonna baste those sides. I've also got my long arm centering tape here, which shows me how far I am from the center. So this one's right about 45. The other side is at 45 as well. As I advance the fabric, after each throat space, I will line it up, make sure it's still at that 45, and that will help me to keep this as square as possible. So that's a little tip there. After I got the basting done in this original throat space, what I did was I went back and I did some stitch in the ditch, or as sometimes I call it, the bones or the stabilizing. But if you look at the picture I've drawn, showing kind of how I broke up the spaces. 
So I wanted to just do that because I don't really know exactly what I want to do in those spaces quite yet, but I'm forcing myself to get started on this. Okay, so some of the stitch in the ditch around these like circular shapes is already done. I also did some stitching in the border here. And what I did was I wanted to continue this shape. So I brought that out to form a square or a diamond. And this one came out to another point. And so I'm just continuing along with those different triangle shapes in the border. Now with this particular shape right here, grab a ruler. I used a ruler to do all of this. So a ruler along with my sure foot and my ruler base. But I used the dual edge ruler and I lined that up so that I was quarter of an inch from each side there. The center is lined up and then I stitched that. Now for this section, I didn't have that exact ruler. So I just took a cutting ruler and I measured Let's see, I think I went this way. And I just measured how far up I wanted it and then where I was at, and I just continued marking all the way around. So I'm using a water-soluble marking pen, and you can see these little blue dots right along the top of there. Okay, so that's how I started with my bones. Now at the end of each section, I advance my fabric. So I'm gonna go ahead and advance this and again, remember, I've already gone through and done this, so it's not attached to this top pole or the top fabric pole. But as I advance, you're going to be able to see that I've got those bones done. But in addition to the bones, you might not be able to see this, but what I did was in the spaces that didn't have enough stitching and I wanted to really stabilize those, stabilize those excuse me, I did some basting stitches. So right in here, I did a one inch stitch, just filling in all of that space that's not already stitched down. So that will be helpful to keep all of those layers in place to try to prevent some of the bunching as I go through and do some more stitching on here. But I've continued down in the borders. I've continued the circular dividing that I did. And we're gonna go ahead and keep advancing. Okay, I've advanced all the way down to the very bottom of my quilt. And originally I did have my quilt top attached to this leader. Um, and what I did when I got to the bottom was I just pinned kind of like along here so that I could take the pins off of the leader and then I stitched a basting stitch all the way across the bottom. So now I am free from this leader and I can take that up and now I can advance back and forth because I'm only on the backing and the take up poles. So that gives me some, some freedom there. Now, I wanna show you one other thing before I get into some of the stitching. It's a little trick that I like to use. So I mentioned earlier when I talked about loading that we are loaded in clear view, or excuse me, we are loaded in standard view. At this point, I like to change my frame down to clear view so that I have a little bit better accessibility with my rulers. I'm not gonna worry about hitting into the pole here. Um, so let me go ahead and I'm gonna back up and we're going to show how I did that. So I'm in standard view right now. I'm no longer using this leader. Generally, even if you're floating a top or whatever you're doing, you wanna have this pole in place to keep everything level, but it sometimes gets in the way when I'm doing ruler work. So rather than keeping it in standard, I'm going to switch it down into clear view and I'm going to just put this pole on the floor so that it's not in my way and I can sit down and not have it hitting my legs or anything. So I'm just going to pop that out into my pole cradle.
And then I'm going to do the tight rope act where I have my little balance thing. And I'm going to set it down on the floor. And usually I'll push it up out of the way. Okay, so now it's still in standard view. I just don't have that pull in the way, but it's not necessarily going to keep everything flat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to this end, release my ratchet so that I can leave some slack on the frame or on the quilt. And I'm going to pop this pull out and I'm going to drop this down the side arm into clear view. So instead of it being up, I'm going to drop it down and I'm going to drop that pole in there. I'm going to do the same thing on this other side. Pull the pole out, drop the side arm down, and then put the pole in the other position. Now I can use my ratchet stop, tighten this up. Now I've got a nice flat surface and I don't have to worry about that bar in the way. Normally the other bar would go in right here and it'd be down here. But again, I like to be able to sit on a stool and I don't want that pole in my way um, with my knees. So that's how I change from standard to clear once I have gotten all of the label or layers stabilized together. Okay, I'm gonna show you how I did the stitching on the border just in this little section here. I am using my HQ mini ruler. Right now I've got my sure foot on. I've got my ruler base already in place. So I'm gonna bring my machine down here, a quarter of an inch away from this stitch line here. Bringing up my bobbin thread. And just so you know my bobbin thread, I am using a superior pre-wound bobbin and it's a white bobbin just because it'll blend or cream bobbin blend the best with my top fabric here okay so i've done a couple little stitches there now i'm going to hold the ruler on that previous stitch line and with that quarter or the sure foot that's a quarter of an inch away i'm going to stitch i pause the machine with the needle in the down position. And just so you know, I have this on cruise at a speed of 50, 12 stitches per inch, and stopping in the needle down position. Okay, now I can put the ruler in position on the other side, stitching along. And I just stop when the edge of my foot gets to this next line, because I know that that's a quarter inch away. Move into position. And I do have handy grip on my ruler to help hold it in place. So that handy grip is just this kind of like sandpaper stuff that I've got on there. Okay. So you can tell ruler work is not a super fast process. And I'm gonna, I think I'm, I might do one more. Okay, I'm gonna bring up my bobbin thread here. Now, when I do it in, you know, regular time when I'm not filming, I would continue on and do this all the way around just advancing the fabric as I go rather than breaking my thread a bunch of times. Um, it can be done either way. I do want to reiterate that everything that I'm doing on this quilt is just the way this particular quilt happens to end up. It's not a right or wrong. Um, some things I might do and then think, oh, I should have done it this way. That would have been more efficient. But just trying to plan ahead as much as I can. Okay, I'm changing my foot out and I'm going to put on my large echo foot and I'm going to use my hand wheel and raise that needle up just a little bit so I have some more space here to put that foot on. Okay, tighten that up. And I've already mentioned this before, you could just use the etch lines on your ruler or you can use the echo foot either way. 
Okay. So it looks like I overshot a little bit on my other stitching, but that's okay. So I'm doing that same exact process, just with the large echo foot, lining the ruler up with my last stitch line. And again, lining it up. And I'm gonna stop when the echo foot touches my stitch line right here. notice that I can change the position of my arm trying to find what's most comfortable for doing the stitching. I'm also trying not to get in the way of the camera too much. Okay. And bring it back, change back to my sure foot, and do that same thing one more time. So not only is this adding some texture to the quilt and something for the eye to look at, it's also using up some of the fabric so that when I go back to do my fills, I don't have to do quite as much fill work in there. So. Multiple birds, one stone. And I'm not in the right spot. We better do it down here where I finished the last one. Okay, too many threads. Now this line that I'm on right now, I didn't get that all the way to where it needs to go. So I'm just going to finish up that first line. Just a few more stitches. Okay. And I'm just traveling up in the edge of my batting. that's how I did that part that was as far as I got and then I was stumped so what I did was pulled out some preview paper so let's get some preview paper here okay so I talked about how I wanted to continue and like make this diamond shape. So I'm going to focus on that for just a second. I'm going to stitch that diamond shape so you can see it a little bit better. Beautiful. Okay. Then I was wanting to do like a continuous curve in the diamond. So I'm going to pretend I'm not going to stitch this, but I'm going to pretend like I've got more mini diamonds in this cream fabric. Now I can do my continuous curve in there. So I'm going to start at this bottom. Move up, up, grab that one, up, grab that one, up, grab that one, and down. Now, little tip with using preview paper. 
because I just had a little panic moment there, making sure that I was actually drawing on the preview paper and not on my quilt. So be very, very cautious. If you are using the side of the preview paper that you've cut, I always recommend putting like some painter's tape or some bright thing on there to let you know that you're at the edge so you don't accidentally draw off onto your quilt because that does happen. Trust me, it's not fun. Okay, moving on. Let's go over to this square shape. I'm gonna outline that square shape. Now I'm gonna use that same echo foot and create a large echo in here. And then I think I might come back and do some kind of a fill in this section. And that will allow this part to pop out a little bit more. Now, with that being said, if I want this section to pop, I want this diamond to pop, this first channel, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna do some kind of a little stitch in there to hold that down. And then I'm gonna do that same thing in this little channel here, because that's gonna hold that section down, allow this channel to pop, allow the square to pop, and allow the diamond to pop. Okay, now that's as far as I have gotten for sure. Here's some things that I'm thinking about doing. Let me go ahead and scribble in this guy. I'm thinking about maybe doing some piano keys in here. I don't know if I want to do them all the same, how deep I want or how close I want them. Or I was also thinking I could maybe do some large pebbles. I've changed to my glide foot here, and now I'm going to work in this diamond section here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is line up my ruler with the edge of this mini diamond and extend that line down. I'm using my water-soluble marker marking pen. I'm gonna do it going the other way. So essentially, I've divided that into four diamonds. Now I'm gonna go back and do a continuous curve. throughout that diamond. And I would have gotten that one too. So that's the, the look I'm going for. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark it up here as well. Now I wanted to use the micro foot for this so that I could see better, but these seams are super thick and the micro foot didn't want to go over them very easily. So I've gone ahead and changed to the glide foot. Bring up my bobbin thread. Okay, there we go. Oh, and let me tell you my settings right now, I'm in cruise. I'm at about 125, it's 12 stitches per inch. And here we go. Okay, so something that you might have noticed when I did that stitchy is that you can't really see much in the print fabric, but in the solid fabric, you can see it a lot better. So that's something I'm gonna take into consideration as I'm thinking of designs through the rest of the quilt. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time doing nice, super fancy designs in here because they're not gonna really show too much. Okay, next thing I'm gonna do is in this section, I am going to do an echo. So I'm gonna to change to my echo foot and I'm using the same size that I did right out here. 
Okay, so I'm bringing the edge of the foot to the inside of that square. Bring up my bottom. Okay, so now I'm going to bring the ruler right on the square. Bring it to the back side of the square. Then I'm going to do that microfill in the center there. And I'm going to do that later once I put my micro foot on. I'll come back and add that. It's kind of hard to see with this echo foot on. The other section that I do know what I'm going to do with, and I've actually started quilting some of it, is in this section here. And I'm going to show you a picture because that is kind of a border that goes around the entire quilt. So I'm going to make that one continuous design. And I'm going to do some ribbon candy in there. Oh, I keep scaring myself that I'm going to draw my quilt. Okay, so I'm just going to continue. And that's going to go all the way around. So that's going to create a border for the entire quilt. And again, I've got that glide foot on to help me go over these heavy seams. That's the ribbon candy. Okay, I'm still working kind of in the border section. I'm now working in these white triangle pieces. And what I'm going to do is add some rays and then some micro quilting to kind of um, separate the different elements there. To do this, I'm going to use a couple different rulers. First one I'm going to start with is an HQ Mini. Um, you can use any straight edge for this. But what I want to do is have my first ray come in about half an inch. So I'm going to find the half inch marking on the ruler and line it up with this corner right here. And then bump the other edge up against my foot that's already in position. And then, then we're going to change to regulated cruise. I'm at 75 for the speed, 12 stitches per inch. And I stitch along. And I'm stopping just a little bit more than a quarter of an inch from the edge, but not quite half an inch. Eyeballing half an inch away and then using my ruler to make sure I am lined up half an inch. Now this part's really important that you use this side of the ruler and make sure it's a quarter of an inch away from this center point. So I'm gonna put that in position. I'm going to stitch along. I'm going to do the same thing in this triangle over here. Half an inch in. Okay, now I'm going to change to this other ruler. It's called Catch and Raise. I'm going to bump that edge up to the foot, and then I'm going to find my first ray marking. I think it's 15 degrees, and I'm going to line it up with this seam line right here, the seam of that triangle. Okay, from here I'm just going to walk it down about half an inch 
just eyeballing it. Rotate the ruler. Rotating the ruler to the next angle marking. And this time I'm going to stitch all the way back to my center point. And then I'm ready to move directly into that next triangle. So finding that marking. It's kind of hard on these lighter color fabrics. There we go. Walking it back to the center. Okay, at this point, I'm going to do that micro quilting. Um, normally, I would use my micro foot, but since uh, I've already got the sure foot on and I don't want to break my threads and I'm going to do some other ruler work, I'm just going to keep the sure foot on. I am going to change it to manual mode though, and I'm at about 700 for my speed. I've adjusted my handlebars a little bit so I'm a little closer. And I'm just going to do some little scribble zigzags. Okay, so that is that. Notice that the, the little squiggle kind of gives some definition between these diamond pieces and the rays, as well as the squares. Wow, Christina, that was so much fun <laughs> to watch your process. You know, I feel like a lot of people do enjoy seeing the process of how somebody else decides, especially custom quilting, quilting. Yeah. It's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, some of it's boring, yeah. but it's it's what makes that finished product. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I had a lot of fun with this one, and this was just the first part. Yep, it's going to be a four part series. Mm -hmm. So the next part, if you join us, it's going to be moving to the next section of the quilt, and going through some more of my thought processes, and just adding in little tips and tricks along the way. So it's been fun. Ah. Well, thanks for joining us today. Be sure anytime you post pictures of your quilts on social media to use that hashtag handy quilter. If you do, your quilt may be chosen to be featured at the end of one of our videos. Be sure to give us a like and subscribe and have fun quilting.